Well, we are live once again with the Emissary Publishing Podcast. I'm Jason Todd with my friend and colleague, Paul Edwards. Hey, Paul. Good to see you. Great to be back again, Jason. So good to be with you. We always have great conversations, and we're about to have a big one. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, with with my friend, my mentor, uh, someone who has uh, whose intervention caused a, uh, a very positive series uh, saga, if you will, of changes up into the present day, uh, but who uh, simultaneously um, has a you know is a, is a published author and fun and oddly enough, his book, uh, which I read early when I met him. Uh, turns out to be a book he never wanted to write. And that's going to make it interesting today. And uh, so I'm excited to bring Aaron Walker onto the show. Well, me too. Aaron, you and I uh, have have met once before today. Sure. And uh, I know that you lead a mastermind and you're influential for a lot of folks. So I'm excited to hear what you have to say about this book <laughs> that you didn't want to write. I think... Boy, that resonates with me, and I'm not because there are things that I didn't want to have to write either. Uh, and I'm I'm uh, super interested to hear what you have to say. So, welcome to the show today. Well, Jason, thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Really, really considered an honor and a privilege to be here, Paul. Good to see you. Always good to see you as well. Welcome back. Uh, welcome, welcome on board this show for the first time, but not, not the first time we've interacted over podcast Big A, and that was a huge. Uh, Huge moment, the very first time you came on my old show, mm. and uh, it's even more excited now to dig in and um, learn maybe some some background about your book and, and your time as a published author that I even as as well as we've gotten to know each other, I still don't know yet. So, um, so anyway, yeah, like you know, that's that's usually where we start. Um, authors don't just get up and write books for no reason. Right. They don't just say, "I got to write a book." Uh, we talk to a fair amount of people who aren't ready for it and we are uh, happy to tell them they're not ready for it. Yeah. But to those who do, uh, when you look back on it, you, you say, you know, what was I after when I did this? Why did I do this? What was, what was behind it all? And for us, that's always where we love to start is what's the why. And so we'd love to hear about the why behind view from the top. Yeah. Well, let me give it to you. But the first thing is, is the book found me. I didn't want to write this book. I mean, a, writing a book was never on my radar in my entire career. And I'm going to give you 60 seconds worth of context. So you'll appreciate and enjoy maybe the remainder of the story without the context. It won't make any sense, but I was a small business owner. 44 years this year, I've been a small business owner. In the first probably 20, 25 years of my career, uh, I was in isolation. I was absolutely operating alone in owning all these businesses. And then uh, in the early 90s, uh, there was a guy starting a radio show here in Nashville. I live in Nashville, Tennessee. No, uh, we don't need any comments about my Southern drawl too, by the way, Paul. I know you like to tease me about this Southern drawl, but but anyway, so I went to a Chamber of Commerce breakfast and heard a guy speaking there about a radio show he was going to start, invited him down to my location. He loved it. He said, hey, why don't you advertise on my show? And I said, listen, man, an hour ago, I just met you. Now you want me to advertise on a show that nobody knows is going to be successful. I've never met you in my life and I'm not interested. He said, well, I'll give you a free week if you'll try. And I was like, well, I got nothing to lose, right? And so I advertised with the guy and three days into the advertising, I called him up and I said, man, I don't know what you're selling. I don't even really understand what you're doing, but I'm interested in continuing this relationship. He said, well, if you do, you got to sign an annual contract. And I said, this is getting worse by the minute. I said, three days ago, I met you three days into a free week. And now you want me to sign an annual contract. And he goes, yeah, if you're going to be one of my sponsors, you got to sign an annual contract. Well, Paul, that was my first encounter with Dave Ramsey. Dave mm -hmm. and I became very good friends, and I went on to sponsor his show for 21 consecutive years. Was well, shortly thereafter, maybe five or six years after I met Dave and started doing some advertising, uh, I had a horrific automobile accident, and I was headed to the office and ran over and killed a pedestrian on my way to the office. Just by God's providence, a few weeks later, I saw Dave at a concert I was at, and he invited me to join his mastermind group. 
So I went to the Eagles mastermind group and joined, and I was reluctant. I really didn't want to do that because you know, Dave is, he's a hard charger. He's going to be all up in my face and he's going to find out that I've got debt on real estate and then I'm going to be in real trouble. And so Dave loved me through that. And he said, Hey man, I want you to be a part of this group. So we spent the next 12 years in Dave's office, uh, really doing life together. Well, about, uh, I guess it's been 10 years ago now, one day we were sitting in there and, uh, one of the guys said, Hey, big A, you should write a book. And I went, write a book. What in the <laughs> world would I write a book about? And he said, your life experiences and some of the things that you've accomplished. Well, I, Here's where you really need context. Dan Miller said across the table from me, 48 days to the work you love. He's written about 12 books. Dave Ramsey sat to my right and he's probably got 15 books in print. But the thing that really killed me the most is to my left was Ken Abraham. Ken Abraham's written about 105 books. Uh, he's a ghost author and has done an amazing job over the years and semi-retired now. He's kind of taking a little break, I think. But I said, who would read my book? And they said, well, you've only lived your story. We haven't lived your story. And I said, but I've got pros around me. These guys are champions. They're New York Times bestsellers. Like who's going to read Big A's book? Ken Davis is a friend of mine and uh, Ken's a very successful entrepreneur, has written books himself. He said, no, 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 you, you've got the wrong, wrong attitude here. I said, what do you mean? He said, based on the book that I wrote last, he said, 17 people decided to not commit suicide as a result of reading my book. He said, if one person's life is changed as a result of reading your book, is it not worth it? And that stoked something in me. I said, you're dead gum right. I said, I'm going to write that book. And so it took me 18 months to sit down and really work through that. But what it took was me stop comparing up comparing to other people and have a stronger mission. And my mission was if this changes one life, it's worth it. So mm -hmm. I wrote the book that I didn't want to write and God has really blessed it, used it in an incredible, powerful way. That's a great, uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the best whys you can have, I think, because the truth is like it, it, we tell clients this all the time, you know, you can go a long way publicizing a book. You can make, you can sell a lot of copies of it. Mm. You can have a lot of people buy it and then they never read it. But if you, if, if, if just one person radically changes the trajectory of their lives mm. as a result of it. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's worth it. And of course there's plenty of, there's plenty more reasons to do it, but, but at a fundamental level, I mean, you know, we're in the business, as Jason and I, Jason and I like to say, of telling stories that matter mm. and right? spreading messages that matter. Mm. And a message that tells another human being, don't give up. Your life isn't done. It's not over. You can, you know, there's more that you haven't looked at and you haven't thought of yet. Mm. That's our kind of story. Paul, you know what was difficult for me in the beginning being a novice was I, I was intimidated. I was afraid of the structure. I was like, I don't know how to put all this together. You're right. I got the stories, but I don't really know how to put it together. And, you know, I hired somebody to help me with that. It was like, and it made it so much more enjoyable. It was like, man, I don't have to walk this journey alone now. Like I've got somebody that's walking me through the process. It was so intimidating to me. I'd never written a book. And so to get somebody to, you know, walk that journey and help me and let me tell the story audibly and come back and probe and ask questions and then help me massage the message or tweak it a little bit. And then I was like, I don't know how to sequentially put it together. And they're like, oh, we got that. We got that. Let's, let's get the story out and then we'll go back. And so you guys do an amazing job of that it's intimidating for a guy like me, right? Because I don't do it every day, but for you guys, you're like, no, let's go through this process. Some of the stories, and I don't really know the format you wanted here, but I wanted to tell you a couple of stories related to the outcome of the mission of the book yeah. uh, that really have been beneficial for me personally. First of all, a lot of people say, man, it's going to be expensive to write a book. And you know, there's, and I'm, let me just be the first to tell you, and this was such a cool story is, 
we did get it into some bookstores and we were able to get it into some airports and we did some things like that to market the book a little bit. And I get this phone call on a Monday morning from a guy and said, uh, Hey, there was a contact information, looked you up on LinkedIn, got your phone number and I want to talk to you. And I said, yeah, sure. So I was talking to him. He said, I want to hire you as my business coach. Hmm. And I went, okay. I mean, the normal protocol is to ask, Hey, who sent you or how did you find out about me? Or, you know, he said, I read your book and it had just come out. It had just come out. And I was like, I was all excited. I was like a little kid here. I'm 44 years in business. I was like a kid, you know, at this time I was like, Christmas morning, you know? And so we talked for about an hour. And at the end of that engagement, he agreed to coaching with me for a period of time. Listen to this. This is the drum roll moment. It covered the cost of the book. Mm -hmm. One client, one guy that have never heard about me in a million years was in California and he hired me and it covered the cost of the book. And I said, this is unbelievable. I can tell you story after story, after story like that, that guys found me as a result of reading the book. They feel like they know you after they've read the book. They started asking me questions about, man, that time you were out West and you thought about killing that guy and that wreck you had, that was terrible. And these businesses that you've owned. And I'm like, I don't even have to sell this guy. Like yeah. the book is telling my story. All I had to do is say, Hey, what is it that you want to get accomplished? I think my favorite story though, and uh, there's countless, I can't even begin to tell you the benefits financially that the book's done for me. Plus it's gotten me on podcast after podcast. I don't even know for sure if people will invite you to speak today without a book. Mm -hmm. That's one of the first things they ask you, have you written a book? And I'm like, I didn't realize how valuable it was to have a book in your repertoire. You know, it's like, you know, oh my gosh, yes, I did write a book. That, and now they're interested right in me speaking because you're perceived as being an expert, whether you deserve it or not, I haven't decided, <laughs> but it gives the perception that you're an expert in that industry. Yep. But I had a guy in ISI, we, I'm the founder of Iron Sharpens Iron Mastermind. And I had a guy call me and he said, Hey, Big A, I want to talk to you. And I said, yeah, sure. He said, my son's 20 years old and he found your book on my nightstand. And I, I, my son is kind of wayward and he's kind of going down a, a, a bad path. And he said, I want you to know, he looked through it and he's reading your book. And mm -hmm. I said, would I have an opportunity to talk to your son? And he goes, would you do that? And I said, I would love to, I'll never forget it. I was at bluegrass country club. I was playing golf and I said, told the guys, I said, Hey, I got a phone call. <coughs> Excuse me. I said, it'll probably last 10 or 15 minutes but I need to talk to this guy. So I went to the locker room and I called him and we were talking, he was real nervous and we were talking and he started asking me questions about the book. And I started sharing with him and he looked kind of up to me cause I'd owned a number of businesses. And so he was really listening to what I had to say. Well, about a week later, his dad called me and he said, you know, I'm Christian by faith and I give a lot of references to my faith in the book and the guy accepted Christ. Mm -hmm. as a result of reading my book. And I thought, you know what? That's that one guy yeah. that my buddy was talking about. And I was like, if nobody ever reads it ever again, it changed that one young man's life. Yeah. I don't know what that's going to do generational. I don't know the ripple effect of what that's going to have, but I'll tell you, I wish somebody had convinced me earlier to write a book because that's my story. Yeah. And everyone listening to this podcast interview right now, you've got a story. And I want to assure you that someone needs to hear it. Yeah. One of the things that resonates with me uh, out of what you're talking about is you, you know, you just finished with this, with the statement, I wish I would have done it sooner. And I find that it takes time to concentrate a message that really matters mm. to you as an individual, you know, to, and like, yeah. you know, we, we, before the broadcast, we were talking about my book and it's like, why did I write my book? Well, it's, it's the things that I needed to say. If I was, if I was going to say, Hey, I want to, I want to talk to you. You're in time of struggle, mm -hmm. man, this is the book. You got to read this because I needed it. And it's not the, it's not a book I would have written 10 years prior by any stretch. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, it, it, in your path, even though, even though you say, you know, maybe, maybe you wanted to write it years earlier. Maybe it wasn't time. What, what was it about the time that you did write it that you knew now is, now is the moment? 
Yeah, that's a great question because many other people had shared with me experiences of how my life had impacted them in certain ways. And over the course of time, having that horrific automobile accident, which I pray no one ever has to experience, there was lessons learned as a result of that, that I felt other people could benefit from, right? And so it was just deciding to be vulnerable and transparent for the benefit and the greater good for others. And so it never was really looked at or designed to be a profitable endeavor, right? It it really wasn't. I, I do hope that people read it and want to join our mastermind group because mastermind groups have changed my life. You know, being in that group with Dave and Dan and Ken and those guys for 12 years, showed me the value of surrounding yourself in community with other non-biased trusted advisors because isolation is the enemy of excellence. And if we want to really excel, we need to be in community. We need to have other perspectives and people to hold us accountable. And I thought how selfish of me to keep that information. I need to share that information so that there's a transformative experience for other people. And so it became kind of a, a giving mindset, not something I could gain as a result. But, you know, the natural reciprocity is people want to communicate and do business with you. But I think if we go into it with the right heart, the right motivation, the benefits that you receive back are 10x what you had hoped they would be. And so I think any of us that write any book should take that perspective of, What will this add to others? What benefit could they receive as a result of reading this book? Yeah, I think I think folks have to get to that point of like we talk. We tell people if you have a product, service, or message that you think is going to change the world, you owe it to the world to get good at sharing that product, service, or message. Yeah, and without Mm -hmm. that first part of I have a product, service, or message that I really need to get out there. If people haven't yet come to that point, then it might be premature, but when to, to, you know, to, to introduce something to the marketplace. But mm-hmm. when you come to that point, that pivot point, perhaps where now I, I have got to communicate this. I find that that's where the, that's where a lot of strength uh, of communication is developed. And without that, it's, I, I feel like messages sort of fall flat. Mm. It's yeah. almost a responsibility. Mm. Yeah. And then you get to a place of conviction and what are you going to do? Go against your conviction and not implement on the responsibility of sharing some good news, some tip, some hack, some experience that others could glean from and possibly not have to go through some of the trials that I've had to experience. And so when you start looking at it through that filter, uh, the conviction gets stronger until it was released in the book. And once it is, you see other people, it's not, it's not a New York times bestseller for everybody, but it wasn't designed to be that it was designed to help a specific genre of people. And it, it's done well at that. You know, I think, <clears throat> and I think for anybody watching or listening, it's just a reminder of what you already said, big A, God took care of making sure that you recouped your investment. Oh, immediately. That's what was so cool. It was like, oh my gosh. It's not like, you know, I mean, if if you bet on that principle, we've talked about that before. If you bet on that principle of sincerely serving his fellow children without any thought of return, he's going to make it up to you. I mean, yeah. he's not, he's, he's not unfaithful that way. But I, 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 I love that. Like Jason, I'm hearing stuff we can incorporate into our language when we talk to potential authors to just enhance it even further because it's like that mindset um this is this is not a this is a responsibility i have you know you you if if you as the author are saying i have to do this this is a this is not just and i and i really cannot concern myself with the roi i can't do something stupid but i but i can i have to look at the numbers but i can't be, become fixated on them Instead, I've got a, I think like when you get into brass tacks of why become an author, these are the kind of things that if, if these thoughts are flowing through your head, then you're thinking about it the right way. But if you're coming to it with, well, what's it, what, what am I going to get out of it? 
mm. as the priority, right? Then yeah. you know, it's well, that's that's why I really love the tagline for emissary. We tell the stories that matter. Yeah. And it it's sort of a filtering mechanism by design. I, mm. I first that I think the statement is is bold. It's sort of in your face. Like we tell the stories that matter. And the filtering mechanism, as I see it, like you're talking about, Big A, the story first has to matter to you as the individual, as the writer. This has to be something that really matters because it really mm -hmm. doesn't matter to the writer. Does it need to be said? I, I would suggest, you know, maybe not. But if it really matters, mm -hmm. then it really matters how it's communicated. I'll tell you a real obstacle that I had to work through initially if this is beneficial to anyone else that's considering writing a book, it felt very self-serving initially. It felt like I was boastful. That's the way. And I had to, because we're taught all of our lives, humility, right? And I think if you go about it in a very confident matter, void of arrogance, there's a sense of humility that shines through. And I had to get to a place of being confident in the message, but not arrogant as to the result of any success that I might've had. Mm -hmm. And so I had to work through that. It was difficult because I can put my name on a book and I'm look at me. I wrote a book and I was like, man, do I want to do that? And then I thought, again, I have a responsibility. Other people will have to decide how they take that that's on them my intentions, my motivation was pure. And I had a sense of responsibility to share a message that could help other people. Mm -hmm. And once I got to that, I was good to go. What was the reaction? I mean, you shared some of the stories already, Big A, but what was, what would you say was the reaction, you know, in ISI at the time throughout your network? Um, was it overwhelmingly positive? Did you did you get a lot of stories right away, or did they just trickle in gradually? Yeah, they were trickle. They, no, it wasn't any. We didn't do a huge book launch. I didn't like get everybody involved. I probably could have done a better job. That's not really my style, you know, to do that. I wanted it to sustain long term, and I didn't want to just blow it out in one fail swoop. And then, so it, it's gradually just continually market consistency for me is everything mm -hmm. and it's in everything that I do regardless of what it is. It doesn't matter. I want to do it consistently. I don't want to, you know, I, I'm a long-term runner. I'm not a sprinter. Right. And so I'm whatever it is I'm going to do, I'm going to do a little bit each day and I'm going to continue to do that. I think that's where you get the maximum return mm -hmm. and you do a great big blitz and you, put it out there and you sell a bunch of copies. And the next thing you know, it, you know, pales in comparison to the launch and then you get disenchanted and then you just let it go by the wayside and the rest of them sit in your garage. You know, I, I didn't want to do that. No. Yeah. And so, yeah, but we continually get comments on it and they trickle in all the time. And there's always somebody saying, Hey, I read your book and I want, you to know, this touched me or this was meaningful. Uh, but I'll have to confess this is that I was very vulnerable in the book. And I think the audience is starving to death for authenticity. Like if you're going to write a book just to make yourself look good, I don't think it's going to resonate with the reader as much as it would be being authentic. Just like I would be on this interview today. I don't have all the answers and I don't know everything but I'm authentic. And even in leading ISI, I'm very transparent. Robin and I fuss about things. Yeah. We've got a 43 year successful marriage, but we still fuss, you know, and it's like, I got kids and they still are knuckleheads sometimes. And, you know, it's like, I don't have it all figured out. Like we're doing this together. Mm -hmm. And I think if you write your book that way, the thing that I was a little bit nervous about also is that I wanted it perfect. And that's just not going to happen. And then I started thinking, you know what? This is who I am. And people tease me about the way I talk. Paul's a champion that he can really do a big A invitation. But but the truth is, is this is who God made me. Yep. And this is what I need to hold on to and write that way and talk that way. I even did my own audible. I didn't want somebody else doing the audible. I wanted to hear my voice. 
there was an inflection and they could tell where I was passionate about certain things. And so, yeah, I, I would say relax. Anybody listening to this that hasn't written a book yet, I would say relax and be you and mm -hmm. go in and tell your story and don't try to make it something that it's not and just have a good time. And I think if I had been given that instruction earlier, it would have been better. It would have made the process a little easier. What are some things that, um, you know, if, if there was anything caught you by surprise about doing this, you know, things positive, maybe negative stuff, but, but it came yeah. out of left field. You didn't see it coming and took a little while to adjust to for, yeah. in terms of being yeah. an author, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's a few things that did, and I'm not going to use any names or companies. I think that wouldn't serve us well. I'm just talking generically. One of the things I wished I had been better prepared for is to market the book. I thought I'm going to do it. And then a company's going to pick it up and go do everything. And that's not reality. It wasn't for me. And I wished I had been better prepared to know what it was going to look like and know what my responsibility was going to be in order to promote and market the book. I wish I had been better prepared there. If I had it to go over, I would have had a better understanding with a plan uh, to market it consistently long-term, not just throw a bunch of money in at once. I would have had a better plan and a budget if it was something that I was really interested in the book, selling numbers of copies, or it was going to direct people towards a funnel, if it was being used kind of as a lead magnet to get people into a funnel, I would have strategically planned a longer term, maybe a year, maybe 18 months with someone uh, that could have helped me work through that process. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel like I was prepared well for that. That, that threw me a little bit of a curve. The other thing was, is it took me 18 months and I don't think it has to take that long. I think it can be done in a much shorter period of time. If I had been maybe educated or coached just a little bit better on how to use my time wisely, um, I think that would have been a little bit better. So mm. you know, just a few of those experiences would have been better thought out. So let's dig into this a little bit now people write books for various reasons. And, you know, before the broadcast, we were talking about writing books and you asked me, you asked me, Hey, you know, what do you use your book for? Do you use it for a lead magnet or, sure. you know? And I said, no, nope, not, it's not, it has nothing to do with the work that I do. Uh, and you, however, as personal a story as it is, uh, you do use it as part of your business. I do. So walk us through, how maybe you wrote that or how you envisioned as you were writing it, yeah. the eventual use. Yeah, it's good. Uh, it's written properly for what I want to accomplish. And I want people to get to know me as an individual. So it's a little bit of a memoir telling a little bit of my story because what we do in the mastermind is a very personable business. It's not a widget. So we, we provide people a service and we're constantly interacting. It's very relational. My first core values relationships matter most, like it's everything to me. And so it's very, very important to me that, uh, people get to know me personally, intimately. So they know what they're getting involved in, in the mastermind. So it's working very well for that. The other thing that I wanted to do was speak some. And, uh, that's opened a lot of doors, opportunities for me to be able to speak. I will honestly say I have no interest whatsoever in selling it to make royalties. Uh, that, that just doesn't interest me. That's not something because my one-on-one -on -one coaching, you know, for what I charge to do one-on-one -on -one coaching, if someone gets this book, they pay $15 for the book or whatever, and they read it and they hire me to do a coaching engagement. It's very lucrative for me to, to be able to do that. And the book has paid for itself so many times over opening doors. And there again, and I said this earlier, it gives you a sense of being a professional, uh, being an authority in a certain arena when you have a printed book. It just does. People just look at you differently. They talk to you differently. 
the weirdest thing for me and why anybody would ever want an autographed copy. I'll never know in a million years from me. I'm like, really? Like they'll stand in line at speaking at conferences. And I'm like, I I'm just an idiot from Nashville. That's had a little bit of success and they want my, they want my signature. Like it was humbling to me, but they do, they want that. Then they want to take a picture with you and they want to put it on social media. And I'm like, wow, this is because I wrote a book right? That's the way it feels. But then they read the book and it's substantive, right? There's something yeah. there and there's something that matters. And then when they read it and they're able to apply that to their personal life and it helps them in some venue, you're like, now you're their mentor, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's like, oh my gosh. So I just can't tell you, man, uh, the benefits, uh, there's countless other benefits as a result of it, but getting people kind of in our funnel, and then they learn more about it. it. It's the most inexpensive lead magnet on the planet. Mm. Hands down. There's mm. nothing that even remotely comes close to the value that it returns for the investment that you make to do it. Nothing. That's remotely really good to hear. Returns. Yeah. Um, I, when I, I was thinking, uh, while you were talking, Big A, that that I, I didn't realize that it was um, when you say a lead magnet. Are you talking about uh, strictly when you're doing speaking engagements, or just out there in general? Like, you're yeah, gonna... I'll give them away. Like, I'll go and speak to a group of a hundred. I went and spoke the other day to 150 people, and I gave 150 books out. Mm. And uh, we had a guy that joined our mastermind immediately from that group and what he will pay me in the next 36 months will pay double what that book costs. Yeah. One person, one speech. And so there's no way, I mean, I couldn't have stood up there and talked and then not given him a book and then him not, I didn't have time to talk to every single person, but he was able to read the book and he knew exactly who I was, what I stand for, my principles, my history. Uh, and he's like, I'm in. Where do I sign? And his name's Joe. He's a great guy. And he joined. And I'm like, and he's going to bring other people, right? And so I don't know how you quantify the value. No. Like, technically, I don't know how you would do that. You know, people say, well, you invest this much money to write the book. It, it, it's really not an expense. It's just an investment. And it's an investment <laughs> into what you're trying to accomplish. And for me, yeah. That's why I said, I wished I'd done it earlier. <laughs> when I think about, um, what you said earlier, <clears throat> uh, the whole, uh, perception that it creates in people's minds. I've seen that too, with the books I've written. Yeah. The fact that you're a published author, uh, it, it like it, it, at the same time, they, they intellectually know what that is, but it sounds it's, it, it adds like a, a dimension of gravitas to your, to who you are. And, and I, I thought about that for a long time and I said, why is that? But when it, when it comes down to it, like if you actually go through the process of writing and editing and publishing and promoting a book, that's a lot of energy and effort and intellectual firepower to bring to, to encapsulate in a single product that they can hold in their hands and they mm -hmm. can read it and then they can become acquainted with you. And I think it's probably the reason so few people succeed with it. And then, you know, in a, in an even smaller niche, it's probably the reason so few people do a good job of actually carrying that message out there mm. is again, you, you separate the, the few who have the message they're they're aligned with the message they are the message and that message matters so much that they'll they'll take it anywhere they'll give it away they'll sure they'll they'll do that and then of course there's a a great harvest to be reaped from that well if it was easy everybody would do it and uh the thing that's really cool too that uh, most people don't really consider i don't think is i would give anything to have had a book my grandfather had written hmm. And it's like very few things I've even got pictures, you know, a few pictures, there's no letters, but to have a book that my grandfather wrote, like I would give anything to have that or my dad. I wish my dad had written a book. 
So there's a legacy component to it as well. Even if it's not a memoir, even if it's a business book or something, it's like well, my granddad still wrote this. Yeah. Right. And to be able to have that or share that or, or things like that. Yeah. It, it's just that there's just, I don't know a downside other than it's hard work. I'm not going to minimize that. It takes a lot of energy, brain power, as you've put it like, cause I really wanted to do a good job. I really wanted to think through it. I really wanted to lay it out in a way that people could appreciate it and adopt what I was trying to convey and hopefully apply it to their lives and some of the mistakes that I made along the way. And like I said, I'm very raw in the book. I'm very vulnerable, you know, but I think that's what endears people to me and to others that do the same. Cause when you're all polished and everything is great, nobody can identify with it. Yeah. It's like, my life's not like that. My life's not all polished. I used to get a little bit upset. I've had the privilege of hanging out with some successful people. And we would talk about difficult situations. I said, why aren't you talking about that publicly? And they're embarrassed. They're like, I don't want to talk about that. I said, yeah, but then everybody else thinks something's wrong with them. It's like, hey, you're successful, but because I'm your friend, I, I see the, the, the dark side also, but you're not sharing that. Mm. These people don't know how to work through that. And I said, we need to be sharing more of that. Don't get your family in trouble. Don't embarrass your kids. That's not what I'm saying. But there's a lot of challenges that go on behind the scenes with successful people. Mm -hmm. And other people need to learn from that so that they can bypass those landmines and possibly not have that in their life. Or say, you know what? A big A went through that. I've gone through this and he overcame it. I can too. It gives yeah. them a sense of hope and encouragement. And that's why I think more books need to be more transparent, more real, more realistic, not perfect, not polished, but let's get the real story. And when you get that, then you can operate from there. As you've uh, so often shared with us in ISI, Big A, um, that's one that has really stuck with me through the years. You, you, And you said this to me very early on in our relationship. You said, I can teach you how to make more money. But if you're still a jerk when you get there, I'm not doing you any good. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, you still go home a loser. Yeah. And um, and one of the ways that that happens, to, to tie that into what you just shared, is for people to, to hear that there's not some magical dividing line between the pure and the innocent and the evil and the wicked. And actually, they, it's, quite, it's quite blurry. It depends right. on, on our daily choices. Yeah, sure. And if we share, if we're open about the bad choices we've made, people who want to, over a period of time, get better and better and better at making better choices and being more on that good side, uh, are going to find hope and inspiration there, which is just the kind of message we're after for Emissary and the kind of message we love amplifying and spreading on behalf of authors. So. Well, you guys are doing a great job. I mean, your reputation precedes you. I'm hearing stories already from various authors and uh, folks that you've worked with. And so you're doing a great job. So keep up what you're doing. Grateful for that and grateful for you and your friendship and everything it's meant to me. And grateful to have you as a guest again, uh, I guess yeah. for the first time on the Emissary Podcast, where we help faith-based founders and executives spread messages that matter. Jason, it's been great being with you as well, my friend. We'll see you next time on the Emissary Podcast.